Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Clear Motive Marketing. I co-founded this high-impact creative agency over 15 years ago to help clients just like you. Marketing leaders that have small teams and large organizations that are often under-resourced and accountable to a multitude of stakeholders. You're executing campaigns every day, all day, and held accountable for everything from immediate delivery to real-time results. It's nearly impossible to do it all well. Clear Motive exists to help you deliver high-quality, high-quantity creative on time, on budget, day after day. You expect great ideas and incredible creative from a national agency. What you may not expect is simplified workflow, modern technology to speed up projects, and activities that achieve higher returns. If you're not getting the consistent results you need, I can help. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or check out clearmotive.ca. Hello at a warm collisions YYC. Welcome to my guest this morning, Mrs. Jenny Lemieux. How are you, Jenny? I'm great, Tyler. How are you? Oh, I'm fabulous. Thanks so much for coming on. We've been chit-chatting away. We got introduced. I love the small world we live in. You're coming in for Toronto. I let my audience know a lot of my guests tend to be in Western Canada. And I was introduced to you through um, a good friend of mine, Mr. Um, Wilson Acton, who is yes. one of the partners at Tallgrass Ventures. And Wilson connected us because you were doing some very cool things over at Vivid Machines. So you're the co-founder and CEO at Vivid Machines. And I'm not going to even pretend to do any kind of a... I'm just going to get into the <laughs> elevator with you. And what is a Vivid Machines all about, Jenny? What do you guys do? And let's start, let's launch from there. Yeah, thanks. Okay, awesome. And uh, thanks for having me on. And Wilson's amazing. So really, really great to be connected that way. He is. Well, let's not praise him too much. I want to go to his head because I know he's going to be listening right now, (laughs) rolling his eyes at us. But yeah, he is a rock star of a human being. And when he introduces me to somebody, I just say yes. (laughs) Oh, nice. Yeah, so uh, we work in permanent and specialty crops. So we help fruit farmers understand what's happening in their their orchards on their farms uh, using computer vision to look at every single plant the way you know a doctor might look at a human and understand its health and then we take that data and we help pass it downstream along the supply chain to uh, like the pack houses and the marketers to help uh, them with things like uh, negotiating sales early or looking at you know how much packaging they need so it's really about how do we increase yield on the farm, quality yield, and then help the rest of the supply chain optimize costs using this little computer vision sensor that just mounts onto any tractor or ATV and essentially takes videos of every tree or plant as people are driving around their farm. Okay. Wow. I, I think you've been in this elevator before, uh, Jenny. It's not, the, <laughs> it's not the first time. And I, and I know we, we chatted earlier. You guys are three years. Just celebrate your three-year anniversary. Yes, I won't even get into Monday. how many versions of that elevator pitch you've gone through to get to oh the one gosh. you just landed on today. <laughs> Uh, I have a very, I, sh- I have an even shorter version. Okay. It might get me, it might get me in trouble, but, um, oh, please, please, please. Okay. You got, you got me interested now. <laughs> People like my, when my neighbor asked me, I just say like Google street view for plants. Um, nice. and they, they get that. So. Oh, I can't, yeah. Make it, make it, make it easy for your audience to understand. I love the concept of, you know, falling in love with your customer's problem. But what I heard mm-hmm. there was a whole group of customers and a whole bunch of potential problems. So yes. when you think of your business, even maybe where it started to where it's evolved, let's just start to where it is now. And then we can play around just the journey because most startups or most, we start off solving one thing and we realize that there's a whole bunch of other things going on. So when you look at those stakeholder groups from the farmer, the operator to the packaging facility, talk to me just about the problems you're solving. Kind of, Is there an order of hierarchy or an order of importance even in the market that's made that problem even more important to solve? Walk me through a little bit kind of where you've landed and maybe we'll chat about how we got there too. Yeah. So the farm is still at the center of everything. Like it's really is, it starts with what's happening on the farm with the growers um, and that's really where we started. And that was like a very, you know, very early days. It was like, wow, amazing. Look at these growers and what they're doing. Um, but what we've come to realize is there is such a massive ecosystem on the food supply chain, uh, you know, whether it's a packers and shippers and retailers, but there's insurance, there's, you know, crop advisors. So there's so many different aspects to the food supply chain. And more and more, we're realizing like how disconnected, um, even people like us, like we focus on one problem uh, because it's, you know, an industry that's changing. And I think the biggest opportunity that we're seeing is how do we help connect the dots um, across the, the whole supply chain using data? And that's what we're really excited about. And we've come a long way. Like if you'd asked me, you know, two and a half years ago, what problem we're solving, you know, it was like, how do we count apples on trees? Like it was very 
focused on that. And now it's, you know, how do we build transparency from the grower all the way to the shipper? And then, you know, also talking to um, insurance and, you know, eventually maybe even down to the retailer. And uh, we're, we're really excited about how much impact that could have if done well. Oh, I love it. And was this simply a function of, you know, how many apples? I love it. It's like, let's start there. <laughs> because no matter what you understand or don't understand about technology, you can understand I have 10 apples or I have a hundred apples. That's going to cause a different outcome. Yeah. Was this a, was this a factor of, oh, wow, now that we've got this data, what if, or, and I'm also curious, the disconnect in this industry, was it simply because I'm always looking for culture versus cause and cause versus culture. Yeah. Well, it's analog and it's hard. And like, you know, you've got the, <clears throat> the I'm picturing the old farmer in the tree, uh, in the, in the orchard walks around going, yeah, we're going to have a good crop this year. Cause he's just been doing that for 30 years. That's hard to scale that to the producer or all the way to the potentially to the retailer. So I'm curious of like, was it simply just because of the analog nature of those industries or is there also, was there a culture barrier to get through of like, well, you're the buyer and it's adversarial and you're the retailer and you're trying to get my price down and I'm trying to get the most dollars. Like curious about just conquering over some of the cultural nuances versus, well, we just didn't have the technology to do it 20 years ago. That's why it got like, yeah. that's why it was like the way it was. So what's so interesting is this industry is really advanced. Once you get off the farm, you know, they've, the pack houses have, ro they've had robotics and computer vision for years for doing things like mm. sorting fruit, looking at quality, packing, like they really get technology. What's been, what's fascinating to us is the farms in permanent and specialty crops. So like apples, grapes, squash, cucumbers, there's no standardization the way there is. Like if you picture a cornfield um, or, you know, like rows of, of wheat, it's been standardized thanks to technologies like John Deere. So it's a lot easier to solve problems on the farm. So what's been happening over the last decade is that fruit farming, uh, working with researchers and, and industry is moving towards standardization. So, that, you know, if you go to a commercial apple farm today, a lot of them have moved away from those big round, you know, big, the big round trees that you picture when you go apple picking. When you're I went apple up, picking like in Southern Quebec as a kid up on Hammingford and Covey Hill, which is apple country. Yeah. And I remember it well. We did it, I think, for scouts to raise money for something. So yes, I have apple picking married in my mind somewhere from when I was 10. <laughs> totally. It's like the romantic view of apple picking, right? 100%. Um, now there are these two-dimensional systems, like the, the industry is really thinking about robotics and standardization and how do you make this more like manufacturing and less, um, you know, putting your finger I, up. I, I don't want to say, but like, to less like, like nature, a little bit willy nilly, yeah. a little bit doesn't. <laughs> and I'm very willy nilly from an industrialized perspective, very deliberate from a nature perspective. <laughs> exactly. Yes. True. So, you know, the, the actual nature of farms and farming and permanent specialty crop is changing to enable the adoption of technologies like uh, robotics and computer vision because of things like there's so, you know, the cost of labor is so yeah. high and, and not everybody wants to go and, you know, pick apples on a farm. Like it's hard to find people yeah. that want to do that work. And, you know, things like um, regulation around uh, fungicides, pesticides, so many more controls, the, you know, climate events, so many more challenges are happening. So the industry is really trying to figure out how do we control what we can control and then, you know, automate where possible. So it's it's been really interesting. We just happened to come at the right time where, you know, there's this transition to this new way of planting um, you know, it started in apples. We're starting to see it in pears and cherries. You know, grapevines are pretty um, two-dimensional. And at the same time, uh, things like on-edge computing uh, has become a lot more powerful. Okay. So, you know, what you're able to do with machine learning algorithms today uh, so that you can run them in real time on a farm that might have no cell connectivity, you couldn't do three or four years ago. So it's kind of this perfect storm of, you know, industry and technology coming together so that, you know, things like what we're doing start to become possible. It's, yeah, starts, the idea might've been there, but the technology just wasn't able yeah. to support it until, until currently. So when you say, and just I, I, a two-dimensional apple tree versus a three-dimensional <laughs> apple tree. <laughs> I'm trying to picture what that is in my mind because I grew up on a farm in Southern Quebec, as most of my audience knows, and I grew up with row crops. We did soybeans, and we did wheat, and we did barley, and we did corn, and corn was the big one, and soybeans kind of came in later before as I moved off the farm. But you're right, it was very controlled, very standard, and one 
one comic corner of them looked like the next and it was yeah. the equipment was all at a huge scale because of how uniform it was so yeah. am i picturing now that we are growing our apples to be differently so that they're more in line with what technology we want to use to harvest them like is that am i is it binary like that in my mind uh -huh. And, and also what consumer preferences are like picture going to the grocery store and the fruits kind of all the same size and color. So how do you make that happen? Right. Um, and of course there are big movements to, you know, what do you do with the, you know, the fruit that maybe don't meet those criteria and there's like frozen fruit and processed fruit and, and whatever it might be, but you know, really the, the high value um, in permanent specialty crops are in those fruit that we see in our grocery stores. Right. So it is a move towards standardizing not only the farm, but the actual produce <laughs> too, which is really interesting, driven by consumer demand. Yes, of course. I just finished listening to, I think it's called the bot, is it called the botany of desire or with by Michael Pollan, where he talks about the evolution of the apple and right from what? like what the apple was. Oh, I'm going to try to identify the book, but it was, he talked about the, like the role the apple played at manipulating us and us manipulating it to become this leading fruit that it's become. And it was quite an interesting kind of storyline. And Michael Pollan is, uh, does more of an investigative kind yeah. of journalistic style, the way he, he does it. Was it called the botany of desire? I think it was. You botany have to of desire. It, to it was, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, I will afterwards. So the audience, pretty sure, ninety percent. I consume audiobooks, so I, I see, uh, which yeah. is awesome. But you can consume a lot of volume. And you're like, oh yeah, where did I actually hear that thing? <laughs> um, it's not even, you know, when you read a book, you're like, it was on chapter two and like page six versus audio. Yeah. It's like, where was I driving in the car when I heard that thing? Um, it's more it was really interesting like, about yeah. it very much. So, but talking about <laughs> Apple specifically and the kind of the relationship we've even had. So to hear this, it's just the next evolution of that journey of our relationship with this fruit that used to be kind of sour and, and misshapen and grew randomly in different parts. And we're talking hundreds of years ago like that and how it was brought to North America and kind of took over as this leading fruit. And it, it almost plays the, uh, the storyline almost plays the, um, the apple as the antagonist protagonist role and humans almost being secondary <laughs> to the apple's desires to expand and become this coveted fruit. But anyways, that's another that's so story, cool. for, I love another that. story for day. It's very interesting. Um, so technology, digital transformation, broad term, digital, yep. not an industry and underpinning. Is this just also part of the natural progression of this group of farms being permanent and specialty crops different than row crops? I think it's, it's really important yep. to identify that just like their time has come. <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I think so. And, and like their time has been here off the farm. But they finally, at least as we know, like farms, there's like, you don't know what the weather's like or the lighting is like, or the, <laughs> like, it's just really yeah. hard environments. Um, and, you know, I think that now it's getting figured out for these like more, I don't know if I want to say complicated crops, but in some ways, yeah, like yeah. you still need like a way of harvesting them with humans and, and they're a lot more delicate and, you know, the impact, um, of a degree or two can decimate a crop if it's like at a key time. So they're more yeah. fragile in that way. Like a cob of corn, mm -hmm. like I used to drive a combine and, and harvesting corn. There's nothing gentle about that because <laughs> it can, because <laughs> it can take a beating. <laughs> it's very violent. That's how it gets. It separates it from the cob. Anyways, we'll get into it. How a combine works. That's a bigger conversation but yeah. it's there's nothing um delicate about that process <laughs> yeah and it's a lot more resilient you need a frost to kind of knock it down and get it to, to die off so it'll dry and all those things when you think of apples grapes i think we can all picture very quickly those are very fragile and sometimes yeah. it's amazing to me they get to they get to my fridge in the shape that they do <laughs> without it's, being it's completely incredible. mangled <laughs> totally it's amazing that the journeys they go on too so yeah i think their time has come i think uh you know especially That's, nutritious Fruit yep. and vegetables, you know, the, the whole, like, we're going to be 10 billion people in 2050 food supply, and food supply, mm -hmm. food supply and, and quality food supply. And, uh, yeah. It's, uh, so for you as a business cool. dovetailing, and I appreciate that, Hey, the supply chain side of this has had mm -hmm. technology and complexity for a long time. You coming in as a, as a, as a company coming up with an idea where you're starting with the farm first. Is it an easier adoption process for the, because the farm all of a sudden now who they talk to goes, Oh, finally, you've got some technology. Yeah, we're on board with it. I'm always just taught, thinking about industries that are slow to adapt and farming construction, things that, that I mean, from the outside, maybe have an illusion of like, Oh, those are those, those, they, they do it the old way. It doesn't, yeah. it sounded like the farm was the biggest opportunity for you as a company to raise that up, but it, sounds like it would plug in very naturally to the ecosystem on the other side that already has been using technology for quite a while. Yeah, I think it's like there's this 
tension. Like the growers are very keenly interested in new technology if it works. Um, so that's like, you <laughs> Don, know, there yeah, is. <laughs> asterisk. There's always an asterisk. No one has time for something that doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, early technologies like computer vision robotics, like it takes a while to get it to work. The, the other, so there's that piece and they have like really exciting ideas. Like our roadmap extends easily 10 years with all the fantastic ideas we get um, from the industry. The challenge is like where the money is. Um, so, you know, the growers already are operating on really tight margins. And like the further downstream you go, I think the larger the margins are. So part of it is looking at how do we bring more of the supply chain into, you know, the adoption of technology like this so that the costs can be shared um, along the supply chain. And we're, you know, we're still figuring that out. Yeah, we're still, you know, that's something that we we'd love to figure out, like unlock value for, you know, each of the stakeholders so that the costs can be shared, uh, essentially. Is there, I appreciate that because, oh, this sounds great, but oh, just a second, what's it going to cost? Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. And I, I, I grew up with farmers. What things cost was always part of the conversation because you're right. And then you had so many other variables that you can't control, like weather and, yeah. and just the markets and what's happening there. Is there, and do you have the numbers? I'm sure you've looked at this. Like, so if I'm a farmer, I'm a large operator, a grower, and I bring this on for my apple crop. If I have to foot the bill, quote unquote, on my own, does it make sense? Like, is there enough of an economic lift? Is it, I'm just going to see some efficiencies or like, no, no, this puts dollars back in your pocket. I love the idea yeah. of bringing the supply chain more into it so we can share in this upside. But if it was just the farmer going out, buying his next quote unquote piece of equipment or his or her next piece of equipment, What's the what are what do the metrics look like? And is is I'm assuming that conversation comes up pretty quick in the in the in the journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll separate out. So we've kind of two clear problems that we're working on. So one is yield prediction. So that's kind of working downstream off the farm. On the farm, it's really helping um, in apples anyway with something called thinning. So thinning is the process of removing fruit from the tree so that you can balance like the less fruit, the bigger the apples. Um, And so they kind of work for this to get this optimal balance of quantity and size. So, of course, the, the bigger the apple, the the more the high value they are. Then there's other factors like, you know, color and blemishes and stuff, but size is a big factor. And then of course, the larger the volume of apples, the more, the more volume you have to sell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way growers look at our technology is if we can help them do a better job at this process of thinning um, by more precisely understanding what should we do, you know, on a given, instead of at a farm level, at a block, or even at a row or a tree level, which is mm-hmm. we're looking at individual trees, they can more precisely thin. They think they can get significantly more bins per acre of the okay. higher value, um, uh, the higher value, like bigger sized apples, mm-hmm. essentially. So that's where we're playing with growers is uh, data for chemical and hand thinning. And could they generate, you know, an extra 10% in terms of bins per acre. And, you know, what would that look like in terms of economics? And it's pretty significant because it's all to the bottom line. Is it still a manual process of like tree 742 was identified that like I'm walking up to this tree now, I'm putting myself, I'm in the field, I'm wearing my gloves. I'm like, okay, we're going to go and thin this tree. Do I pull up my phone or my iPad and get a snapshot of this tree with like, I'm, I'm thinking I'm immediately, I'm in a video game and the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones I have to pull off. Or I have to thin. Is it, is it that like, cause there is a transition from like, it's all great to have this data, but someone has to go out and physically do this, <laughs> which I'm well, sure robots are coming along in the journey here, but maybe not yet. <laughs> yeah. No, the first step in the process, um, the growers do something called chemical thinning, which okay. is really risky. So it's like a spray, um, that it's like, innocuous. I think it just like is a growth rate hormone that slows, it might slow or speed up um, growth. Um, So what happens is if they can do this application correctly, it saves a lot of the hand fine tuning later. And depending on climate, like the West coast that is drier tends to do more of this at blossom, the East coast where it's wetter, they're a little more reluctant to thin a ton at blossom. They kind of do it at blossom and when the fruit are really Okay, small, just depending just, on what zones you're in and how the climate it, affects, right? It, exactly. So if they can do that well, it really limits the amount of hand thinning that they have to do. But there is still a hand thinning component. Okay. And 
some of the growers have come to us and, and have said, like, can you put this in Google Goggles so that our guys can know exactly exactly what you said? Tyler. Okay, okay, good. Which okay. fruit? Okay, we're a ways from there, but <laughs> you know, that, like, that's I've got my like hollow lens on and then the tree is there in front of me and it's pointing with an arrow to which one. But we're not that like, far away from that. Totally I've seen right. those applications happening you know? in oil and gas facilities and putting on the hollow yeah. lens. And I know it's still, we're right on the edge of sci-fi, but sci-fi, unfortunately or otherwise, turns into reality sooner than later these days. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. So that's like, you know, it's like, how do you actually take this data and ingest it into autonomous equipment um, is, you know, for now, we're just starting to see autonomous sprayers over the last couple of years in the market. Yeah. So, you know, building that in and then also helping humans really understand, hey, you know, go do this section of this row and take these many apples off, but don't worry about the rest of the block because it looks fine type thing. So being really, you know, precision agriculture is really where we're playing. Uh, and right from now. your, what you're seeing, where are we on that journey? Are we in the first inning, second inning? Are we like halfway through the game? I don't know. I'm just picking a sports analogy for lack of better way to, to put a, put some guardrails on this question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm terrible at sports, but okay. Sorry, then that's a very I know, that's a non-inclusive way. Uh, if there if if there's I'm ten like, if there's ten levels in the game, are we at level right? two? Okay, yeah. Okay, let's just go back to anything. There's ten levels. There's ten rungs in the ladder. What rung of the ladder are we on? Let's go with ladders. That's, that's appropriate because okay. you need ladders when you're pruning your apple trees. So. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like two years ago, I would have said like a two or a three, and then this year we saw so much happen. Like really interesting, like autonomous drones flying around picking apples and you know also you know a bunch oh, of different it's companies like sci-fi to, to the it's like literally yeah, from a movie like that's amazing totally i love it and you know like early commercialization so you're like still rocky but working so you know maybe like a six or seven it's i can't believe how much things have shifted in the last year it's really exciting to see the transition and your and, platform and, from a data collection perspective is able just thinking about the business model and the scalability that's providing essentially kind of the blueprint of the roadmap of this tree whether it gets plugged into a robot a sprayer a, whatever the case may be that data that you collect through your technology becomes then the grist for that mill, right? To, to you keep stick with our food and stick with our food. Members. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that's okay. exactly our vision. It's like, how do we, you know, continue to build this massive data set across permanent and specialty crops that could power things like prescriptions for fertilizers and spraying, but also can it help with insurance claims and all sorts of other stuff. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's kind of the the vision that we have. Curious around the universal, like how disconnected is the is the ability for all these systems to communicate with other? Because you know, totally. oftentimes in new technologies, you're like, oh, well, we're running it on this uh, type of platform and we're running it on that. And as the average individual, I just want to bang them together and have them all work, right? Why will my yeah. phone not talk to my car in the way that it's supposed to? What's that looking like in your industry? Is there kind of an agreed upon, this is how we build and this is the languages we use? No. Or is it all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> it's still all over the place. Yeah. I think because... The problems are so massive. So companies like ours pick one and start there. And you like it takes a long time to solve that one problem. If you, you know, if you're building an apple picking robot as an example, like that is a huge problem that's gonna take years. So you're not then you can't it's not then easy to get on your roadmap. Plus we're gonna integrate and like be the hub and all this other stuff. So I, I do think that that's the critical next step. Um, is how do these systems talk to each other? How do you, you know, build a platform uh, instead of just, you know, having technologies that solve part of the problem? Um, is that, you talked about the, the, the actual, the whole downstream chain being a lot more sophisticated. Is that, is there a more of a universal way of doing things there that can be pulled up? Just thinking about, okay, what's the industry already doing that we can kind of, or, or maybe it doesn't align. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't uh, align yet. Like okay. I know that some of the pack houses are implementing like ERP systems as an example. Like mm -hmm. they're really starting to look at the whole system of what they do, but they still need to understand what's coming off the farm. So that's the connection that's missing. And it, it's okay. a very physical thing. Like it's okay. You pick the apples, you put, you know, you're on like say 500 acres and you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of bins of apples that are being transported to a pack house. How are you tracking those? How do you know where they came from? Where are you putting them in cold storage? Who are you selling them to? Like, but somehow you're still tracking this physical asset through the process. Um, so I think that's 
where the where there's an opportunity and then connecting into the rest of the the system i think is have we got great. there with row crops and the reason i'm asking is i grew up on a farm but i've been off the farm for many many years and ultimately it was it looked like it was going to be a good year it looked like it was going to be a good crop but until you ran the combine and put it into the truck go oh wow we're going to run out of bin space we do not have enough room like this is better you didn't really know until day of and i know technology has improved drastically since i quote unquote yeah. lived on the farm but have we have we conquered that challenge in row crops or is it still kind of that what comes off the field and what ends up into the system you don't really know until it actually happens <laughs> You know, like I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that yeah. because I'm so focused on what we do, but mm -hmm. I know a lot of startups looking at things like, you know, grain quality and and that sort of stuff and trying to use computer vision for Sim things similar. in row crops. But I do think, you know, with companies like John Deere and Kubota so focused on solving for these much bigger industries, just like when we talk about acreage globally, mm -hmm. um, they're definitely further ahead. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the large equipment manufacturers are acquiring companies to sort of put that chain together um, in addition to the technologies they've already built. So I, well, it all know, comes down to food supply and we have a growing population, we have a growing demand. And, you know, as soon as any type of globalization looks de like destabilizes, whoa, how are we going to get that tanker load yeah. of grain from there to there? And what do we do to get more out of the yield and, and oftentimes over farmed and, and soil that's just been taxed <laughs> to the inch, and, inch of its cap capability? And now how do we get even more out of that plant? It's, a, it's an interesting yeah. challenge. It's not going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> And, and there's so many opportunities with machine learning um, to sort of say, like, you know, the way we got, you know, moved so much faster in terms of, you know, controversial, but uh, how fast vaccines are getting developed. Like, you know, could you understand soil health and its relationship to fertilizer um, and other things? Um, yeah, the short answer is More yes. quickly using it's, machine yeah, learning. Of course. Yeah. So there's like a lot of cool things that I think people are working on. Um, well, I was at a conference and, the other day about uh, quantum computing, which is a mind bending yes. topic unto itself. Amazing. But they were saying like yeah. one of the primary, like what, what are some of the real, they, I appreciated the, 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 the organizer because they tried to make it applicable. Cause if not, are you going to sit around with a bunch of quantum scientists and just have your brain explode? Cause you just don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> but they said like the running of chemical of scenarios around chemical compounds is a huge opportunity yeah. for quantum computing because of the speed. So to me that would fit right into, well, what is the correlation between this type of fertilizer? Or, there, or this nutrient deficiency versus this chemical and what would happen. And, you know, it gets pretty exciting as we able or to solve bigger and bigger problems faster and fat. Like it's the size of the problem, but the speed at which we can solve it. But that's yeah, another podcast then, for another. I'm not even ready to talk about quantum computing yet. My brain is still trying to process oh, the concept. I, I still try to like really wrap my mind around what it is. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, and then the, the, the next interesting part back to one of your earlier questions is, okay, you've got all this technology. now how do you operationalize it? Like, how do you actually, yeah, you, make you know, work? make it all work um, across the food supply chain? So I think there's massive opportunities there too. Like that's, that's going to take time. Uh, just changing. Isn't that also kind of just like you things. said, part of the journey, like it takes time. Yep. We're gonna, there's a bunch, oftentimes things are fragmented and as it comes together and as it matures, there's more consistency because it's those universal ability to work with each other is what allows things to scale. If not, it's a bunch of good yeah. ideas hanging out on their own. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Yep. Mm. So we just From have to like, Sorry, last. go ahead. Not catch up. I think I'm already my next question. I'm, my brain's already spinning up to the next thing. How has been the journey? You're, you know, three years. Congratulations, you made it to three years, and that yeah. just gives you the right for, to do the next three years. Um, how has it been with investors? How is the business community? Like, obviously, ag I find is such a world that oh, it's kind of over there. If I don't understand it, I haven't worked in it. What's that, yeah. what's that journey been like for you around? Uh, getting people to support this it did, like is was was it easily enough to understand soon enough did people get the opportunity what's been the business journey around kind of funding the adventure yeah fundraising sucks <laughs> jenny, <laughs> jenny, jenny got very quiet and very serious there for a second mm. my god we have amazing investors i think you know having something that is a combination of we build hardware for agriculture just limits the pool of people yeah, willing to okay. look at the opportunity because it, it's 
complicated. Um, and it's, you know, not, not as well known as, you know, we're it, building. Jenny, you know, it sounds, it sounds, exp- for- it sounds expensive. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so you, you put the word hardware out there. It's like, Oh, wait a second. That's a whole other thing. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's, there's like misconceptions, like, uh, you're going to sell like expensive equipment to farmers. I'm like, uh, yeah, actually, have you seen John Deere, like tractors? Yeah. You know how much those cost? Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, More that technology than my car, <laughs> like literally. Exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so that really sort of, I would say more reduced the the pool of investors we spoke to, but the well, ones that could be that efficient we... for you because you have less people to talk yeah. to now. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for the silver lining on this one. Um, did it also yeah, I mean, increase the size of the pool because you've got people like this is a global opportunity. This is there's specialty crops, permanent crops all over the world. I'm assuming North America is probably your Canada, North America is your starting ground, but this probably has yeah. no limits border wise in my mind. Or, or am I am I thinking about that too big? Mm-hmm. No, I think it's just later stage, like for, you know, uh, okay. we raised our seed seed round um, in Q2 and, you know, you're still pretty geographically limited yeah. just because of resources at that stage. I think in the future, it will really increase the pool, but it also, you know, it brought us investors that are really passionate about the space. Like, you know, we're not just another another company in the portfolio they like invested because they really believe in the mission and vision and they really Mm -hmm. believe in sort of the transformative nature of of what we're building so the uh our investors are just fantastic i feel so grateful like they're really here behind the scenes part of the team helping us a ton so it was worth the well there's there's getting uh, checks and there's getting help right those are two different things right and and i know (laughs) yes i know it's like tall grass and groups like that that i know because i know them personally are very invested in this space and the reason why they chose this space was because they were believing in it and the opportunity and you know i had wilson on the podcast years ago and i remember he said he goes tyler who's more innovative than a farmer They've had to yeah. compete with the weather, with the market, with their geographies, like everything forever. He goes, to think about them as like being antiquated is a complete misconception. And he goes, it's just wrong. 100%. <laughs> it's wrong. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and that always, it always <laughs> stuck with me. And, you know, oh, technology and innovation. There was, there's been an analog version of that long before there was the version we see today. They're trying to, what's yeah. a better way to run a planter? What's the better way to seed? What's the better way to find fertilizer? And I appreciate when you work with an industry that's been doing that and kind of fighting against a lot of <laughs> a lot of headwinds, yeah. or literally and figuratively over the years, it only makes sense that like, oh, wow, this technology is actually going to legitimately make my life, my output, my farm, my team, everything better. I mean, I'm, I'm at least curious enough to talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every, everyone talks to us, which is so different, you know, working, yeah, I've cool. worked in media for a while, like selling to, you know, like automotive and real estate and banks and whatever. And it was hard to get people to pick up the phone. Whereas even with growers, you. like, yeah, nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> the growers are like, yeah, okay, cool. No, that sounds interesting. Let's, let's hear more. Um, so at least they'll give you an opportunity, which is, mm-hmm. which is great. And, and they are looking that. for solutions. Yeah. So, Isn't that kind uh, of the old has, adage of selling to the farm? Like once you make it into the yard, then you get invited into coffee. And if you get invited to lunch, then you know you're really in good shape because <laughs> I've heard that. And I was like, I thought back to my childhood. I'm like, that is not inaccurate. The, 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 seed, the, the seed or equipment salesman that actually got invited in for coffee, my dad was going to talk to him more. And my mom was going to talk to him more than the one who's like, no, we're not buying today. Get your pickup truck and go. <laughs> anyway, thinking back as I was standing there at 10, watching all this go, this, this go on. Um, talk to me a little bit. You said, mentioned like 10 your roadmap and where the unlimited Mm -hmm. opportunity, what are some of the next key milestones? Like what's really on your plate right now? And six months from now, if I had you on, you'd be like, Hey, we've got to here. And that was a big move for us. Yeah. I think the, the near term is we just have to get a lot better at what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. So how do we double down in apples Mm -hmm. over the next six months and really like just knock it out of the park? Apples is the play for sure. Mm -hmm. Just for for now, yep. Uh, um, nice, so, nice for now. Mm. Uh, for now, yep. So uh, making our system way more autonomous, so like super easy to use, removing any kind of human in the loop stuff. Like, hey, you actually got to count the tree first, and so like whatever. Um, so really, and then making our models really excellent in terms of you know how accurate the predictions are. And then taking that and taking that model, um, and, and then also we're you know working beyond the farm. We've, we've on our roadmap is in apples. Like, how do we double down on some of the stuff downstream in the supply chain? And we're really excited about some of the things we're building there. So take that and then rinse and repeat. You know, grapes. We're talking about kiwi fruit, cherries. You know, just kind of and so then many. Even, you can kind of go through the list of your of, of your basket really at the store and go all the fruits that fit into that category would be the next markets you can tackle. 
Yeah. And are they are they more similar than different? Good question. Um, the ones that we've explored to date, yes, like on a surface mm-hmm. level in terms of, you know, the types of problems they're trying to solve and then what the supply chain looks like in terms of, you know, okay. there's a farm and then the fruit, like, you know, depending on whether it's wine or, you know, something like kiwi fruit, it gets packed, it gets sold, it, you know, it's kind of the, the same so there's insurance, like it, it really does look very similar and similar problems that, you know, with the really large scale uh, producers, you know, the, the people running the company aren't necessarily on the farm. So building that visibility is something you see with some of the global, the global brands um, in, in fruit production and, uh, and other stuff too. Um, so pretty repeatable. And, you know, what we like to say is we're on version three of our hardware. Jonathan's just finalizing the the design and build right now. And what he's built is an end to end real time computer vision system that could be applied to anything. So it's like this, like plug and play. It's, it's actually the technology is amazing. Um, plug and play. It's this multi-spectral camera that can, you know, run it 10 to you know 15 kilometers an hour digitize everything all the data pipelines are there all the capabilities of then providing you know a front end for predictions so we're really excited like could you ever take that and like make it available in you know squash and cucumbers in places where we won't get to for a very long time and like just oh, have this okay like the, the yeah, platform itself so, and its capabilities <laughs> yeah so we've built this amazing platform and so our focus is you know figuring out the sort of what it looks like commercially in one application like right. apples kind of, but then kind of working really, it right right through it kind of end to end right mm-hmm. exactly but then taking that model and sort of you know blowing the doors wide open and saying hey you can rinse and repeat this anywhere with this technology and that would be um, kind so. of is that like an open like open source licensing like it sounds like you're also creating we've got our own areas that we focused on and really perfected such as apples but hey, we don't want to hold back that this can benefit other industries with similarities. Let's create another revenue model there. I'm just thinking about the business. That sounds like you're you're really throwing off the limitations of growth there. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're thinking about that and how to how to make that possible. But you know, right now it's like it, it, we're really interested in collaborating with, for example, university research groups. But some of the it, some of the challenges dealing with there is like, okay, what about IP considerations? Yeah, like, how does yeah. that work? It, it, that sort of stuff. How do we support that? So, but you know, that is kind of a direction is like, okay, we're going to play here, but then how do we enable a much broader universe to, to build data sets that you need for research and, you know, you know, development. Of yeah, this data of is endless stuff. what they can be used for. We're thinking yeah. very much the economics of how does it get to the retailer? How does it get money to the grower? But you're right. The data of analyzing this and that and the impact of things. And again, the, the quality of that data set and who might be curious about that. That's not even a commercial application. They're just from a research perspective. Mm. Yeah. And the, the mm. whole reason why we built the system we built is because there was no ability to collect, you know, data this way on permanent specialty crop farms, like really high resolution. Um, you know, we did some really cool research with Cornell Agritech and grapes where they used our system because it's multispectral to do early detection of downy mildew. Um, so, you know, having this high resolution data that can predict so many different things because of the nature of the optics didn't exist. And we've built that. So now it's like, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> what do we get to do with this? I'm, well, the simple I'm so ability to predict versus backward facing, like once you do harvest, everything's backward facing. But if you're in yeah. a point where, where we predicted this in the spring and then the fall, this is what actually happened. And then we're going to slight to narrow in that this blossom that looked this way when we had a bunch of percentage actually yield, yielded an increase or a decrease in crop. And I love that moving it to predictive versus just looking in the review mirror. Because once it's yeah, off the field, well, then we know, then we know, but then, we know. but then you can't do anything to change it. <laughs> you, you've yeah, got what you've and got. Also closing the loop. Like if you're able to say like, Hey, you know, you know, here's what your soil looked like and climate looked like, and ultimately your yield looked like on a really granular level. And what did it look like this year? And how's it different next year? And then, okay, you have all the data. You've got the ability to sort of tie all of that together um, year over year because you have the the yield data on a really great basis. Overlay that with what happened weather wise, like that's really exactly. interesting. Really quickly, yeah. Um, that's where I, I start to get excited. <laughs> I can I can tell your enthusiasm for this is obvious, Jay. I love it. Um, realities and roadblocks. Anything? Is this just the time it takes? What's is it getting the right people? Obviously, it sounds like funding. You've got some great partners, so that's amazing. What are the things that you're like? Ah, you know that that there's always friction. What 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 causes yeah. friction in, in in your growth journey when you look ahead for the next year or two? 
Yeah, I think just the time it takes, like we, it, and it, you know, it does come down to resourcing, but not just because a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve, for example, say it's detecting downy mildew in grapes. These are research problems that haven't been sort of built commercially and operationalized. So how do you take that and build a model that is scalable across, you know, hundreds of cameras, um, you know, deploying real time results uh, is is really hard and it takes a long time. So, you know, how do we actually build these solutions in a fashion that is fast enough that we, you know, can still onboard customers, meet expectations and not run out of cash. <laughs> Essentially. Is, is you can only, can, like. yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't survive on research alone. You've got to actually make yeah. it, it's got to be reality. Do you find yeah. that with your investors and you spoke very highly of them, which I'm glad to hear that you, are they patient? Because I've, you know, I've often heard, I've talked yes. to investors and like, you know, we need a little bit more patience in our capital pools. <laughs> Do yeah. you find that they, that, you know, coming into ag, things take time. You can't, you can't grow a, you can't grow an apple overnight. Like those, I'm sure those jokes, is that a, re, does that translate to your funders? Yes. They're not expecting okay. like an exit anytime soon. Um, so they're, they're patient that way. Okay. Um, I think our, our challenge is more, are we delivering to customer expectations yeah. um, with where we're at today? And, eh, you know, we need to do better. Like at, every year we get way better, which is great. So, you know, m- what our investors want to see is that customers are really excited about what we're building. So sort of that tension of, okay, we need to improve to continue, continue to improve the technology because the growers are really excited about the capabilities, but we're not quite there yet. And then our investors want to see that the customers are engaged and retained. So that that's more rather than sort of an, uh, a patience around an exit. That makes sense. From a customer perspective, if I have 5,000 trees, am, is this potentially viable for me versus someone who has a hundred, 500,000 trees? I'm just going to pick two random numbers. I'm thinking about the small yeah. farms where I grew up and there was a lot of, they were large operators for the region, but they were still regional operators. They were still smaller. They weren't big conglomerates. Mm-hmm. So we're testing a new business model this year that will work for smaller farms, but it is definitely more challenging. Like the, mm-hmm. the unit economics make a lot more sense kind of yeah, once you makes, get to sense. a certain scale, but that's, what's exciting about working with some of the marketers who sell for maybe tens or, or dozens of farms is, you know, if, if mm. they have a stake in it, back to pulling them into the, into, the, into the cost. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And then, and, and somehow splitting the cost uh, across small farms, but um, logistically it's a little challenging. We tried it this year and it's like, okay, well, you know, somebody's driving around and you got to pass the camera to the next farm and driving around. So, but you know, one of the great things that mm. Jonathan, my co-founder has done with this next version of our hardware is he reduced the cost to less than half. So we're going to keep working on which uh, is the journey of technology, the right? And hopefully, it gets, yeah. b- gets better and low and and more approachable cost wise at the same time. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, Jenny, want to be respectful for time. I know you got a busy day ahead. Um, what's the best if someone wants to learn? This was a lovely comment. I feel like I just keep peppering you with questions for another hour. Um, but I will let you. I will let you go with your day. What's the best way for people? Do you have a preferred? Do you like LinkedIn? You know, if someone's just dying to chat with you, what do you have a preferred way to get a hold of you? You know, probably Instagram, like a DM through oh, our nice. Instagram. Okay. Right so on. at Vivid Machines. Um, I don't know what you, but like LinkedIn, I get a lot of oh. stuff that isn't, I don't even know if it's humans. <laughs> I would say it's probably <laughs> not. The amount of jobs that are, the amount of jobs that are just right for me. I'm like, did you even look at my profile? Like uh, sometimes I'm, I'm like, I don't think the shipping receiving job really fits any experience I've ever had. <laughs> But I hear you. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So DM on me. Okay. I think you're one of the first people DM that have Instagram. said, contact me on Instagram. I love it. I've been, I've, I've, I've been the machines. That's why I ask because there's a million ways to yeah. communicate, but there's ones that yeah. just work better for each of us, right? Mm-hmm. 100%. And obviously your website, go check it, go check it out and learn yes. a little bit more. Um, thanks for coming on. This was fun. I, for I look forward to it. I look forward to it to be continued <laughs> and where things are because there's the, the dust is not settling on Vivid Machines anytime soon. So really excited what you guys are doing. And the farmer in me really loves the problem you're trying to solve. So thank you for the work. Thanks, Tyler. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.